Thanks, Randy. Um, Randy's influence on me has been at least as big as any influence I might have had on him. I have always, ever since I've known Randy, thought about psychological issues in evolutionary terms. Um, and I don't know how much we'll get to talk about an evolutionary approach to some of the things I'll talk about today, but um, uh, I certainly have uh, an evolutionary understanding uh, of these issues I'll be talking about. Um, 150 years ago, John Stuart Mill, the philosopher, uh, wrote that the logic of science is the logic of business and of life. And what he meant by that is that there's nothing esoteric or unusual about the way scientists think. It's pretty much just the common sense. Uh, and uh, that was true then. It's no longer true. Uh, because in the intervening 150 years, scientists and statisticians, my not making enough noise. Yes. Scientists and statisticians and logicians and philosophers have invented a huge number of concepts uh, which are the foundation of modern science. And that's the way they, we know the stuff we know is by these concepts that were introduced. Uh, but even scientists make only very little use of these concepts in their everyday lives. Uh, we make huge mistakes in, re in reasoning, every one of us, uh, every day of our lives. The simplest things like categorizing the world, characterizing the world, is Joe a nice guy, uh, predicting the future, uh, will Jane make a good teacher, uh, assessing causality, uh, do I work better if I have a cup of coffee than if I don't, uh, am I more pleasant to be with if I have a cup of coffee than if I don't, uh, making decisions, uh, should I continue to work on this project or just drop it? Um, and uh, we're not even that good, uh, us scientists, at critiquing the scientific and research that gets presented to us in the media. I promise you that every week there are several things published in the New York Times alleging to be science, which are just nonsense. Uh, and uh, there are tools as scientists would allow us to see that, but, uh, but, it's, but we don't tend to. Because we don't know how to frame questions in such a way that our scientific concepts can make contact with them. <clears throat> so um, I'd like to talk today about uh, six different concepts that uh, come from three different fields, statistics, scientific methodology, uh, and uh, decision theory uh, that uh, you've heard of every one of these concepts. Uh, you've probably used most of them professionally, uh, but I think you'll see by the time I'm through that they can be extended much beyond uh, their scientific home into everyday life. <clears throat> um, if uh, I told you I have a business executive acquaintance uh, who recently interviewed someone as a potential manager. The guy had a great record in his previous uh, uh, place of employment. Um, he uh, was highly recommended uh, by his previous employers. Uh, but in the interview he had with a guy, the guy just didn't seem to have a very insightful approach to problems in his company. He seemed sort of low energy and went back and told his colleagues, I don't think we should pursue this guy. I think he's someone we'd want to have. If I described that to you, uh, you would probably, oh, I can't take off my jacket because <laughs> microphones are attached to it. Um, so <laughs> I may have to hold them in my hand so if I get too hot. Um, so I can put them on, oh, okay. Can 
people still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so if I told you about this guy, no, it's reasonable. Sounds like the kind of thing that happens. Uh, but suppose I told you about a college football coach who uh, watched a practice uh, for a player who had been recommended to him by the coaches at the high school. He said the guy's terrific. I had a great win-loss record, quarterback. But he watches the guy, and the guy missed throws several passes, gets thrown for a loss a few times. He just doesn't seem to be in control of the ball. So he goes back to his colleague and says, I don't think we should pursue this guy. I just don't think he's got it. That doesn't seem like quite as good a judgment of it. Now, why is that? Uh, it's because we know perfectly well that athletic performance of that kind is uh, subject to a lot of error variance. Any given act, any given period which we observe someone can give us uh, observations that are not typical. Uh, we automatically frame a judgment about someone's athletic ability as a sample from a population, it's just automatic. And we know that that population of events is subject to a substantial amount of error variance. And as a result, we know that we have to apply the law of large numbers to it, which says that sample values resemble population values as a direct function of their size and an inverse function of the error variance associated with each observation. We don't have that kind of information for interviews. We only, and most of us will only participate in or either as interviewer or interviewee, a very few number of interviews in our lives, we don't realize the error variance that's associated with that. And the error variance is absolutely enormous because the predictability of, of anything that you might care about from the 30-minute interview is about 0.1 on the average, next to nothing. That's on the job performance, that's performance as a, as a college student, as a medical student, as a physician, uh, as a pre-score, anything that anybody's ever looked at, it never exceeds about 0.1. It's perfectly terrible uh, basis for prediction. <clears throat> but we don't see enough of that behavior to have a clear idea of the error rate, and so we don't understand that we don't have enough evidence. Um, the, um, this kind of failure uh, is important not just for, uh, for role as employer during interviews. Uh, we uh, looked at people's judgments about the correlation between uh, a spelling test for a sixth grader uh, on one occasion with spelling tests for another. We assessed this by asking, them, "What? suppose you know that John got a better grade than uh, James uh, on the spelling test, on one spelling test, what's the likelihood he'd get a better grade on the other, some randomly chosen one? Or we said, John got a better grade than James on the first 20 spelling tests in the year. What's the likelihood that he would have gotten a better grade on the, on the, on the total of the 20 tests in the, in the rest of the year? Uh, we're able to convert those probabilities to a correlation assessment. So. What you see there is correlation estimates. And what you see is that people's judgments about the item to item in psychometric terms, that is one occasion to another occasion, it just so happens that both for spelling tests and for basketball scoring, which we asked about, people are right on the money. Uh, they're, they're very aware that there is some significant predictability, but not great predictability, from one occasion to another. And they're aware of the fact that um, if you have 20 occasions instead of you're predicting another 20 occasions, that that increase in the end gives you a lot better prediction. They're not all that well calibrated about it. They think if they go from 0.5 to 0.75, when actually what happens when you go from 0.5 to 0.95. But they understand the principle of all large numbers. But we also looked at people's judgments about uh, personality uh, trait-related variables, honesty, 
uh, and friendliness, where we have the data, we know what the data actually look at, look like. Uh, people actually managed to get it right about 20 occasions, how honest the person on the first 20 occasions correlated with the honesty on the next 20 occasions. Uh, they're accurate about that, but they are spectacularly wrong about how much you can predict someone's honesty or someone's friendliness from one occasion with them. Uh, we just are not able to frame that kind of uh, behavior in such a way that we recognize that it's associated with a lot of error variance, and therefore we've got to use the law of large numbers. Um, how much agreement do you suspect that there is between any two reviewers for a you know, potential article for the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology? Any two reviewers, what is the correlation? Let's see hands. How many think point one? Point two? Point three? Point four? Point five? <laughs> point six? <laughs> Sold to the point three. Yeah, it's about point three. Uh, what do you suppose it is for solid state physics proposals for the National Science Foundation? Any two reviewers? Point one? Point two? Point three, point four, point five, point six, <coughs> point seven. Wisely, many people are refraining from a prediction. <laughs> uh, but uh, in fact, it's point three. Uh, you can call the point three coefficient the judgment coefficient, but any two experts judging some, uh, some aspect of their profession, which tells us, or ought to tell us, we're not aware of it, since reliability goes up as a direct function of the square root of the end, just doubling the number of reviewers gets a big gain, number, doubling the number of judges. Quadrupling the number gets a huge gain in reliability and consequently in validity. And we just, I mean, that's about everything in our lives, judges, about everything in our lives. We just don't recognize it because we don't frame those things in the proper way. Uh, there's a phenomenon uh, in baseball called the sophomore slump. And that is uh, uh, the rookie of the year, the best baseball player the new, uh, among the newcomers, is rarely the best one the next year. And when people speculate about why this is, they'll say things like, well, you know, the batters are making, the pitchers are making the necessary adjustments, or you know, the guy does really too well and he gets cocky. But uh, let's think about how somebody gets to be uh, the rookie of the year um, by having substantially more talent uh, than other people uh, on, on average. No question that it's going to be above average, probably much above average. But in order for him to be the rookie of the year, everything else has got to go right, too. Uh, so a rookie of year one year may have particularly good coaching. He does particularly well in the first few games, builds confidence, uh, he gets engaged to the uh, girl of his dreams. But the next year, he gets an elbow injury, which keeps him out for six weeks, and uh, his uh, fiance jilts him. Uh, so uh, somebody else, the great dice roller in the sky, gives all the breaks to somebody else who's now uh, the rookie of the second year. Uh, so it's a simple matter of regression, uh, and this is a, so another concept which we see is all, lying around us all the time, but we just don't tend to see it very well. The extreme observations of events are likely to be followed by less extreme observations of the same type of event to the extent that there's variation for observations of the type in question. I mean, maybe if somebody's height, there's not going to be very tall, he's still going to be very tall. Uh, but it, on the second measurement, but for by kinds of variables uh, like anything having to do virtually with human behavior, uh, you're going to get regression. And predictions for events of one kind based on events, uh, observations of another kind, have to take into account the degree of correlation between the two kinds of events. So if you tell people that uh, John is in the 95th percentile of sense of humor, and then you say, how? Where, where do you suppose he is in IQ? People say, oh, about the 95th percentile. 
uh, on IQ. <laughs> And they'll say that even they say how how close a correspondence do you think there is between IQ and sensitivity? They say, well, it's a correspondence, but <laughs> not all that great. So they, they understand the general principle, but they're not able to apply uh, regression to understand it. Um, so um, I but I give a question like this to freshmen, University of Michigan. Uh, I, say there's, I have a friend uh, named Catherine. She's a manufacturer's representative. Uh, she loves her job because she likes to travel. And she loves to, she's something of a gourmet and she likes to eat in restaurants that have been recommended to her as particularly good. Uh, the problem is, however, that she finds typically when she has an excellent meal in a, one of these new restaurants, she's typically disappointed uh, the second time around. Why do you suppose that is? <coughs> a freshman will always give you deterministic reasons for this. I'll think that, well, maybe the chefs change a lot. Or maybe her expectations get so high that uh, she, uh, uh, they, they can't be met. Uh, but uh, let's think about uh, what you might expect of meals at restaurants. Do you believe? Uh, that there are more restaurants in the world where you could get an excellent meal every time? Or do you think there are more restaurants where you could get an excellent meal some of the time? Nearly anybody will tell you, oh, it's probably more the second kind of restaurant. If that's the case, it means that you get an excellent meal at a restaurant, your expectation has got to be that the next meal is going to be less good. That just follows logically from what people believe to be about the world that there's going to be regression. Nevertheless, we're surprised at it. My favorite example of uh, a um, uh, regression, failure to recognize regression, given by uh, Danny Kahneman, psychologist who is <coughs> an Israeli. And he was once talking to uh, Israeli flight uh, trainers, pal trainers of uh, pilots. They said, you know, psychologists have discovered that it's more effective uh, to give feedback about people's uh, successes in learning, say that was really very well done, and explain why it is, than it is to uh, criticize uh, their well, it's poor performance. And that's not, wasn't there done very well, and uh, here's why. And the pandemonium breaks out uh, in the room. And they said, why, <laughs> Professor? Uh, that may be the way of the things that you look at, but I tell you, it's not that way in pilot training. Uh, we find that uh, if somebody uh, executes you know, a particularly good uh, maneuver uh, and we praise him for that, that's great, this is what was right about that, next time around, it's not nearly as good. Uh, and on the other hand, if a guy uh, executes a particularly bad maneuver, we say it's terrible, that's disgusting, we shout at him, the next time it's probably going to be a, a better maneuver. In other words, we find that regression operates <laughs> in pilot training as it does in so many other areas of life. Uh, well, let me switch to some scientific method kinds of questions, some of the statistical ones. Um, here's a kind of study that you read about in the New York Times, and I did a few months ago, uh, looking at uh, the fatalities per uh, vehicle mile uh, of various kinds of, of autos. And one finding, for example, is that uh, there are enormously more fatalities per mile for Ford F-150 pickups than there are for Volvo station wagons. Then you see that, you hear that, well, you know, I knew Volvos were supposed to be pretty safe, so that's not too surprising. I have a quiz for you. See if you can match the driver with the auto. <laughs> um, we don't actually assign people autos at random. Billy, you'll be driving a lovely powder blue station wagon. Uh, people choose their own uh, vehicle. Um, and the principle here is self-selection, which is devastating. All kinds of data that prevent us with in scientific studies uh, as in life, uh, the subject chooses not only the subject's level on a given variable, 
put the level on a host of other variables as well. Um, it actually makes more sense to talk about self-selection with respect to auto than with respect to the person, although autos aren't doing the choosing, but it's in, in effect as if they were. The autos are choosing the type of driver, the autos are choosing the type of condition under which uh, they're driven. So we really have learned nothing from that uh, government study of uh, fatalities of autos about the relative safety of those cars. Uh, where it becomes quite important, and this is again, <coughs> once a week the New York Times minimum, uh, you will get uh, findings reported like this. Uh, men who take vitamin E uh, are less likely to have prostate cancer. You say, how about that? You know, if you're a man of a certain age, you say, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take me some vitamin E. Uh, but uh, there's a self-selection issue here. People who take vitamin E are different in God knows how many different ways from people who don't. First of all, they got the money to buy vitamin E. Secondly, there's an education. They say, well, learn about that's probably a healthful practice. Uh, so it might be those things or any of the other healthful practices that people, rich educated people, are more likely to engage in than less rich, less educated people. Uh, and you applying multiple regression analysis, examining the association of each of a number of independent variables with a dependent variable, net of the association between every other variable and the dependent variable is not gonna do the job for a variety of reasons. Uh, if you think about that, back to the Volvo Ford uh, issue, uh, the people who did the study said, well, don't worry about uh, the self-selection issue. We did multiple regression analysis, and we controlled for age and gender. Now, how many young men do you suppose they find driving Volvo station wagons? And how many old ladies are driving those Ford pickups? Uh, you can't completely control uh, for those kinds of variables. You don't know how, and there's a many, many reasons. You have to uh, know the reliability. You have to know the validity. Take simply social class. Any study like this that you read and read a little bit further, they'll be controlled for social class. Well, how do you control for social class? Uh, you can use education as your indicator, or you can use income as your indicator, or you can use prestige of occupation as your indicator, or some combination of those. And we don't know, which, I mean, God does not tell us which of those is the best indicator of social class. And it turns out that studies like this on um, 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 vitamin E and um, prostate cancer uh, vary in their answers all over the map as a function in part, among many other things, of the definition of social class. Uh, there's only one way you're gonna find out whether vitamin E is good or bad for uh, 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 prostate cancer, and that's to use the gold standard of research, uh, flip a coin, see who gets the experimental treatment, and who gets the control, and measure the outcome. Uh, and now, by definition, the people who are taking vitamin E have exactly the same level on average as those who are not taking vitamin E. You control for that randomly, so they're the same. And now we can ask what happens to people who have been required to take vitamin E versus those who have been required to not take it. And the answer is that vitamin E increases the likelihood of prostate cancer. Uh, hormone replacement therapy for menopausal women for decades uh, was believed to be a protective against cardiovascular disease. Uh, there's no question the correlations are there. Even when you control for everything and all these uh, multiple regression analysis, uh, and somebody say, well, let's, let's try doing the experiment here. Let's give some of these old women uh, the uh, uh, hormone replacement uh, therapy and some of them not. And it turns out that hormone replacement therapy is a cause, a uh, contributing cause, of cardiovascular disease. Um, the application of these principles to um, all kinds of uh, issues uh, are uh, 
extremely important to be aware of. Um, I'd say there, there, I know of at least a dozen very important uh, health questions uh, where uh, there has been uh, uh, the results of the randomized control experiments are the <coughs> opposite of the multiple regression analysis. And more commonly, what you're going to find is that the multiple regression analysis tells you that this healthful seeming practice is associated with better mortality and morbidity outcomes. And when you do the experiments, it's just that's not the case. There's actually a name for this in public health, uh, the problem here. It's uh, called the healthy user bias. So people who, uh, who engage in one healthy practice, exercise, uh, a diet, uh, alcohol in moderation, uh, et cetera, <coughs> tend to engage in all the others. So the healthy people are doing healthy things, and as well as things that are reputed to be healthy, like vitamin E and uh, 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 <coughs> hormone replacement therapy, uh, but which aren't. Um, so if a something sounds healthy to you, it's probably going to turn out that there is a positive correlation between doing that healthy thing and, and health outcomes, uh, even if the correlation is not positive uh, but negative. If the New York Times were to announce uh, next week uh, that people who drink scotch and eat pretzels for breakfast have lower mortality rates, in 10 years, they would have lower. People like that would have lower mortality rates because people who read the New York Times and have makes lots of money and care about their health uh, are going to start um, drinking scotch and eating pretzels for breakfast. Um, in, the, um, in, in 2007, uh, when uh, Barack Obama announced uh, for the presidency, uh, he was invited to come to Google uh, and talk to the employees, uh, question and answer session. Uh, and uh, as a joke, Eric Schmidt uh, asked the first question, he said, uh, well, Senator, uh, could you uh, tell us what you think would be the best way to sort 30 million integers? And Obama says, well, I think the wrong way to go would be bubble sort. <laughs> now, Schmidt hit his forehead. <laughs> My God, that's, and the audience breaks out into applause because that, in fact, is the correct answer. You wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to use that technique. And in the audience that day, there was a man named Dan Soroker, uh, who decided on, uh, who listened to the rest of Obama's talk, who said, uh, "I believe in science. I believe in evidence. Uh, I'm going to run the presidency accordingly." Uh, and Soroker decided to go to work for him because he felt he had something to offer. Uh, the Obama campaign. Um, around Google, they have a term, a derisory term, for what it is that most companies do when they have to make a decision of any kind. They get the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. Uh, and at Google, they don't care what the highest, they don't even ask the highest paid person what his or her opinion is. Uh, they just do the experimental test. And Google is constantly doing tests on you. <clears throat> is a blue border better or a red border better for getting clicks? So Schmidt brought that uh, to the Obama campaign. Uh, and here they tried uh, the following stimuli. Which do you suppose got what? combination of image and text do you suppose got the most clicks you know, to follow the Obama campaign? A turquoise portrait of Obama, uh, a black and white photo of the Obama family, or a five second clip of uh, Obama giving a talk, and which of the, of the uh, text was best? Learn more, join us now, sign up now. I find I don't have intuitions about that. Uh, but in fact, one of them is 40% better than any other in getting clicks. And it's the black and white photo and learn more. Uh, and 
people who do have uh, beliefs about what might happen, you can probably ignore because around who, uh, there's a saying, assumptions tend to be wrong. Uh, and uh, as a social psychologist, uh, I learned a long time ago uh, that when it comes to human be novel human behavior or human behavior in novel situations, assumptions tend to be wrong. You just, you've got to test it. This has all kinds of implications in ordinary uh, life and business decisions. Suppose you uh, own a grocery store, uh, and in America, most groceries uh, are arranged uh, in categories, uh, aisle four for sodas, uh, aisle nine for, uh, for cereal, etc. But there is a different way of doing it, which they tend to in Japan. They arrange things by the type of food that you might prepare for that. So they have a miso soup area, they have an Italian food uh, area. And which would you suppose would be better? Well, you're not going to, well, probably, I don't know. The American way is probably better for Americans, and the Japanese way is probably better for Japanese. Actually, this holistic way of doing things is much more effective for Americans. Uh, and the reason is that you were going to make Italian food that night, and if you're doing categories, oh, I forgot to get the Romano cheese. Uh, but that's handled for you when you go to the Italian food area. Oh, oh, oh I'm on a few those. That's good both for the uh, for the uh, retailer who makes more money because you're selling more food, uh, and it's good for the customer because the customer is making uh, an Italian dinner instead of buying a frozen pizza, uh, something cheaper and worse for them. Uh, there were some clever people uh, in. Uh, El Paso, Texas, a grocery chain there, who recently tried to see if there were ways that they could get people to uh, eat more fruits and, and vegetables, buy more fruits and vegetables at any rate. Uh, so uh, they um, tried a sign saying the average customer uh, in this store spends so many dollars on fruits and vegetables. That substantially increased. People are susceptible to social influence. They say, oh, gee, people are buying that much money. I should be able to buy more fruits and vegetables. For whatever reason, they buy more fruits and vegetables, which again is good for the retailer because a profit margin is better on fruits and vegetables, and it's better for the customer because that's better than that frozen pizza or most of the other things they might buy in the store. If you put a sign on the cart saying, place fruits and vegetables in front of the cart, that doubles the sales uh, of fruits and vegetables. So uh, those uh, grocers are doing well by doing good. Uh, in your personal life, one of, the, of our greatest failings uh, as scientists, everyday scientists, statisticians, is detecting covariation. Uh, we think we can do it. Uh, and we're astonishingly bad at it, uh, especially astonishingly bad relative to how good we think we are at it. Um, so uh, the classic studies here were done by clinicians, clinical psychologists, uh, giving people tests, uh, which uh, psychological tests which have no actual value, draw a person test, uh, and you ask the uh, psychologist, what, what kind of drawings do paranoid patients tend to get? I said, well, like, funny stuff about the eyes, either big eyes or small eyes. Uh, and people with sexual adjustment problems, what, what kind of pictures do they draw? I said, well, draw genitals maybe, or ambiguous whether it's a man or a woman, or a woman in man's clothes, or whatever. Uh, and all of that's nonsense, it's not true. Uh, they're quite confident that it's the case. If you give a bunch of stimuli to college freshmen where there's no correlations at all, they'll see the same correlation between paranoia and uh, funny eyes, between sexual <coughs> adjustment and uh, various things having that seem sexy. Uh, and, uh, and they're also quite confident uh, that they've seen those. The truth is that if we find a correlation to be plausible, we will see it 
even when it's not there. In fact, if it's strongly plausible enough, you'll see a positive correlation where there's a negative correlation or, uh, or the opposite. So you might ask, well, how, how good are we when we don't have um, uh, uh, prior beliefs about which way covariation goes? Let's get rid of that by giving people completely barren, arbitrary stimuli. So you can have people say their name uh, in a particular, uh, a particular volume uh, of the particular frequency, uh, sound frequency, uh, high pitch versus low pitch, so somebody say, uh, Aronson. Uh, was a bard. Uh, and now I ask people, what's the correlation between the position of the alphabet of the person's name uh, and the pitch uh, of the voice? Uh, and uh, the, such arbitrary associations, which people who have an expectation one way or another, requires a correlation of 0.6 before people reliably see it. The contrast with pattern uh, uh, recognition is uh, amazing because we are incredibly good at detecting patterns, um, but very poor at detecting uh, covariation. So if you want to know whether you work better if you have coffee than if you don't, uh, then uh, uh, you're going to have to randomly choose your coffee condition every day. Otherwise, you'll be having a cup of coffee because your spouse made coffee that morning, or you'll be having a cup of coffee because you really feel very groggy, and, uh, or you'll be not having a cup of coffee because you were in a rush, and you're not going to be able to, we're just not good enough covariation detectors, even when it's stimuli and responses involving ourselves, uh, to figure that out. You have to do the experiment. You have to do the, uh, the gold standard in order to find that out. Well, what causes indigestion? Alcohol? Going to sleep too close uh, in time to a meal? Eating a big meal? Uh, spicy dishes? I mean, you're going to have to do systematic observations on that, or any conclusion you come out with is likely to be mistaken. Um, does meditation make you a better person, make you a more relaxed person? Um, you better get your base rate before you start, and then start doing meditation if you want to really be uh, trying to increase the likelihood of being correct. Do meditation for a month, and don't do it for a month, and see what happens. Otherwise, it's just shot in the dark guessing. Uh, we pay uh, an extremely high cost in society uh, for not doing uh, certain experiments. Uh, so far, $200 billion has been spent uh, on uh, Head Start. Uh, and we don't know whether that does anything at all for IQ because re assignment was never random, the experiments were never done. We do know that for poor minority kids, there are types of daycare which can have a big impact on intelligence, but we don't know whether Head Start is one of those or not. Uh, and there's never been uh, uh, much money at all uh, put into trying to assess what kind of uh, pre-K uh, education are effective. Uh, on 9-11, uh, 9,000 grief counselors descended on New York City, uh, unfortunately, uh, because every study of effective grief counseling shows that it makes things slightly worse for people. Uh, they're likely to have, they still be very upset and rattled uh, months after the event. Uh, a social psychologist uh, named uh, Pennebaker Jamie Pennebaker uh, has, I mean, by the way, grief counseling, if you look at what they do, it's extremely plausible. I mean, you get a bunch of people in a room, you have them tell about their experiences, they can compare things, and the, uh, the uh, uh, counselor uh, explains that these are totally normal and that they're probably going to recover from these. Sounds great, but it isn't. And I don't pretend to know why. No one that I know of pretends to know why. But Pennebaker has invented something he doesn't do anything immediately, but a month or so after the trauma, he has people write an essay about it, what it was 
life that have been treated. And subsequently, people are significantly better off who've been subjected to extreme trauma. I don't know why that works. It doesn't seem very plausible to me that it would work, but uh, it does. Um, a number of years ago, some prisoners in New Jersey had a great idea, it seems to me get junior high kids who are at risk for delinquency into the prison, and they tell them how horrible it is uh, in prison. Um, it's so boring, food is terrible, uh, there's physical violence all the time, there's constant susceptibility to, to sexual uh, uh, abuse. Uh, and this actually increases the likelihood that these kids uh, will commit crimes. The studies, the best indication from the studies, what, what we get per dollar spent on scared straight programs uh, is that each dollar spent uh, costs about $140 in incarceration uh, and crime costs. Again, I have no idea. I mean, it's a great idea to me. Sounds, sounds prudent. It just isn't. Uh, OK. Um, many years ago, my wife and I uh, bought a summer cottage, uh, and it took us absolutely to the edge of our, our finances, and we didn't have enough money to buy furniture. So I decided I would make the furniture myself. Uh, for many people, this would be a good idea. <laughs> Uh, not for me. Uh, I'm the kind of kid who used to, and I made a model, and there were always parts left over uh, at the end. So I, well, I'll, I'll learn. I'm not, I, no reason to assume I'm not teachable, so I uh, took a class in, uh, in uh, furniture making. Uh, and after 15 hours uh, of doing this, I had a box. Uh, this, is, this can't be uh, the way to, uh, to function. I was, of course, paying a huge opportunity cost for doing this. It was 15 hours to get a box. God knows how much time to end up with some crappy furniture. Uh, I was not paying sufficient attention to what economists call opportunity cost. And uh, there's something slightly depressing about uh, in microeconomics when you really get it under your belt and come to fully believe it. And that is everything you're, you do involves a cost, namely the net benefit of not taking the next best action. Uh, so now, there were many, many actions which were far better for me, uh, had far greater benefit than, <coughs> than getting this crummy furniture. Uh, so I was, I was not paying sufficient attention to the huge opportunity cost I was paying. I've been much better off, and this is actually what we ended up doing, eating peanut butter and pizza for six months, getting cheap old furniture, and then we made got a little more money replacing it with decent stuff. Um, it's not customary for us, not common for us to frame actions in terms of their potential cost. Is this the optimal thing to be doing now? Don't ask the question. Anything like as often as economists do of themselves. What costs are being paid for it? What else could I do that would benefit me more or less? But the, the number of situations where it makes a, a real difference whether you pay attention to these uh, costs or not is very large. Suppose you uh, own uh, an office building and you need an office yourself. So uh, you have an office in that building. It feels like it's free. And in fact, an accountant might say it is free. But an economist would say, well, wait a minute. If you could rent an office somewhere else for less money than you could get for the, an office in the building you own, you're paying an opportunity cost uh, for that. Uh, so it's a, there is, a, there is a, a loss associated with <coughs> what you're doing. Uh, I dearly love my colleagues at Michigan, but I'm constantly trying to get them to to frame hiring decisions in opportunity cost terms. Uh, and somebody, a good psychologist, comes along, let's, 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 let's hire old so-and-so. I said, well, wait a minute. I mean, what's the next best action here that, that, that we might have had? Well, we 
could we find someone likely as good or better uh, if we made an effort to do so? People say, oh, oh hmm, they hadn't thought of that. Well, they should have thought of that. There's, there's any hiring decision involves an opportunity cost. Um, economists, by the way, are a different species from the rest of us. They don't mow their lawns. Uh, they don't do home repairs. They don't do their income tax returns. They don't certainly don't do anything that you could hire a small boy uh, to do. Uh, and um, you know, and I'm I'm sh I'm sure they're right. Although I keep on doing some of those things myself, I have to admit. Um, my first year of graduate school, uh, the first project uh, I did uh, was um, a personality project. It took a lot of time to develop the materials, uh, and then to collect the data, the analyses were complicated, and after months of work, uh, I didn't look like I had anything. I, so I took the data to my advisor, Stanley Schachter, we looked at them for an hour and said, hate to tell you, kid, but uh, there's nothing here. You win some and you lose some. It's acceptable. I mean, this is what I've done with myself in graduate school. So I dived back in, did lots more analyses, did a couple of other tests, and still nothing. I didn't have an economist in my elbow to say, you know, you can't get that time and energy back uh, by continuing to work on that project. Uh, and they might even have had the helpful cue to whether I should be doing it. Suppose somebody else had collected this crappy data, would you still be analyzing it? <laughs> no, of course not. Well, if that's the case, then you shouldn't be either. And the principle here is the sunk cost principle, which reminds us that resources spent to attain a goal can't be retrieved. Suppose you had uh, bought a ticket a month ago to a basketball game, paid $100 for it. Tonight's the night. The star's not playing. Nothing hangs on the outcome. And you have 45 minutes drive through traffic to get to the, to the thing. And you ask people, do you think, what do you think you'd do? Do you go or not go? And most people say, well, you know, I wouldn't want to waste that $100 which the economist says, honk, wrong. You can't waste that $100. You don't own it anymore. It's gone. Uh, it's uh, sunk. Uh, and now, you might think this is <coughs> helpful maybe, but you, the economist saying this to you is probably not going to do it. As a psychologist, I have a trick <coughs> to perform uh, that may actually get you to do it. Because you may know the sunk cost concept, but you know, darn it. I mean, 100 bucks? I'm going to i sure watch TV and I spent a hundred dollars for something. You know, um, a lot of times I've been to games, I didn't expect much and it turned out to be exciting. Um, and there's, there's really nothing on TV. Uh, that's just called dissonance reduction. Uh, so uh, you make it sound uh, potentially attractive and then you can justify doing it. Uh, but here's uh, what I would recommend to do in that kind of situation. Uh, suppose you didn't have tickets uh, to the game, uh, and a friend called you up and said, uh, I have tickets for tonight's basketball game. Would you like to go? If the answer would be terrific, yeah, I'll be right over and pick them up. Then go, by all means. Uh, but if the answer would be, hey, you've got to be kidding. The star's not playing. Nothing hangs on the outcome. There's traffic to get then stay home, uh, crack a book, uh, pour yourself a drink. Uh, so, drug companies will sometimes justify the extremely high cost of their drugs by saying we have to recoup the development cost, and they're pulling your leg. They're going to charge whatever the traffic will bear for that drug, whether they paid $1,000 for it or a billion dollars for it. But we don't understand the sunk cost concept, so we let them get away with that kind of argument. And we let politicians get away with arguments like, you know, we have to continue <coughs> this war because we must not have a situation where the, the dead uh, have died in vain. So we're not going to get those people back by virtue of continuing the war. 
uh, clever business people are aware of this uh, concept. There, there's a project going on in their company where it well, doesn't seem like this is going anywhere. They replace the manager uh, because they figure the next person in, if there's some cost there, that the new manager is not trying to retrieve the old manager's some cost. Uh, so um, they're much less likely to, to uh, continue with boom dogma. Uh, okay, well, I'm actually just winding up. Uh, so, um, in John Stuart Mill's time, the Re Industrial Revolution was just getting underway. The average American, the average Briton, uh, had somewhere between zero education and two or three years of grammar school. And over the, in the ensuing 150 years, the education appropriate for the Industrial Revolution just kept increasing. The three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, you can't do most industrial jobs uh, without knowing those things. Teaching categorization, uh, teaching people how to think about abstractions, teaching people how uh, logical thinking of various kinds. Uh, and the, uh, the, the consequences of that were absolutely massive. Uh, you may know about the Flynn effect. Between 1947 and 2002 in the United States, IQs went up by a standard deviation. <coughs> The difference between 100 and 115, that's the difference between probably only finishing secondary school and being uh, a, an obvious candidate uh, for college. Uh, and those, those, the differences are real and stuff. But, well, that's IQ scores, how about intelligence? So, and they're not the same thing, that's true. But uh, there's no question that intelligence has gone up. <coughs> but the Industrial Revolution is not where we are now. We're in another revolution. The information revolution, uh, and that requires skills in collection of data, generation of data, analysis of data. We've gotten smarter in those ways too, but nothing like uh, what we can accomplish. You, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're going to have a much better tool in the not too distant future, I hope, for the information age too. Thank you. Questions? Thanks a lot for an interesting talk. Um, were there randomized controlled trials done on Scared Straight and Head Start? And if not, how could you say that one cost a lot of money and the other did no good? Or one did a lot of harm and the other did no good? Uh, the studies weren't done for Head Start. There were, there was never random assignment to Head Start studies. There was random assignment to some kinds of K, early pre-K programs, uh, but on their face, they looked like they would be more effective than Head Start, uh, and they certainly were effective. I, I, I meant to say grief counseling and scared straight, sorry. Oh, uh, grief counseling, oh absolutely. Grief counseling has been literally a half dozen very good experiments on each of those have been done. Uh, so they're random. So they randomly assigned people to not have any grief counseling. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, your catalog of human follies is very interesting and entertaining. And I was thinking that uh, you can't really evaluate the performance of anything without knowing what the thing is designed for. So do you have thoughts about what the mind is designed for and how that stacks up against the, those failures and so on? Well, uh, yeah, that, that gets to the evolutionary angle on that. I actually think our minds are superbly designed for the place of this. Uh, I wouldn't have a different mind at all. I mean. And contemporary hunter-gatherers don't suffer one bit for not having the kinds of principles that I'm talking about today. Uh, they don't suffer for not being able to do reading, writing, and arithmetic, or abstractions. Uh, uh, lovely example of, I uh, can't remember, the Soviet psychologist in the 20s. Uh, somebody can know who 
who just uh, I'm thinking of, who uh, ask uh, uh, peasants with no education, trying to see how good they were at logic. He started out saying, yeah, they're perfectly good at logic. Their logic is, and we couldn't design a human being without logic. So he would say things like, uh, uh, in the north, all bears are white. I have a friend who sent me a letter yesterday, and he, he lives in the north, and he told me he had seen a bear. What color do you suppose it was? How should I know? Ask a friend who saw the bear. <laughs> Abstractions like that uh, and applying logic uh, to them just isn't something that comes naturally. It's an easy trick, however. And one thing, one optimistic thing I have to say, first of all, I know the kinds of problems I've talked about today. I know what a University of Michigan undergraduate does, education does for it. Chemistry and, uh, uh, no, in general, the hard sciences uh, and, uh, and the liberal arts do nothing at all. After four years, they don't do one bit better on these kinds of things. But students who've had behavioral science or social science are a hell of a lot better. Of the kinds of problems that I've been talking about, they're 70% better at the end. So it, and that's only scratching the surface of what could be done. Because I've been doing studies in the laboratory teaching these things. It turns out you can teach uh, the law of large numbers uh, in 20 minutes. And it affects potentially everything which is which, which would be illuminated uh, by the law of large numbers and it does so out of the context and at a later time we call them up saying we're an institute for social research a telephone poll we ask them a question and if they're applying the law of large numbers they answer it one way uh, applying it the other if they're not applying it they answer it the other way then significant gain so um, and that's what made me write the book. I thought, my God, this stuff is so easy to teach. We're really very smart. <laughs> it's uh, the principles, the most powerful principles, certainly the most powerful principles that I talk about are very easy. Some cost, bang, you've got it. Uh, the problem is knowing how to frame problems in such a way that the, uh, that the principles can make contact with them. And that turns out to be not that hard. You just give a few everyday problems, you show people what the framing is like, and they, and they really, and they gain.